Hey guys, this is the long awaited, one month already, Port O'Connor report. Now, because I can ramble on and on about this, you know, salt water is my favorite and I'm most deprived of. Um, let me put some parentheses around my reporting on the Texas Gulf Coast and hopefully uh, you'll see this and remember this. I live 300 miles from the coast, so when I go, I may go for three or four or five days at a time, but it's a snapshot of a certain point in time. Unfortunately, uh, I guess I won't be living on the coast for a while, <laughs> maybe never, but uh, that's why the Airstream is one of the things that you've seen that I'm working on is to have a maybe a, uh, a second base, so to speak, on the Texas Gulf Coast at times. Uh, so what I've decided to do is limit this to a spotting Oktoberfest two beer limit. So I've got two beers to get this report done and we'll be cutting in hopefully some stuff from the actual Port O'Connor trip. Uh, but that's in parentheses now. When, when I do snapshots, that's exactly what they are. This is a snapshot. And so the, the parameters of what happens here on this trip are for this trip. However, they are, they can be repeated at any time. Like we've got a hurricane passing by right now through the middle of the Gulf of Mexico and it'll probably cause the same kind of situations that I'm gonna go over um, in Port O'Connor. Port O'Connor is a, a unique place. Um, it's, it's nestled in with a lot of other places that are much more commercial. But uh, let's get this started, okay? And number one, hopefully it won't take two. I mean, I got a two limit, but maybe I can get done before I get to two. It would be nice. You know, October is a great month in Texas. Uh, it's really interesting in North Texas because it can be hot like it is now, um, or it can be cold. In North Texas. North Texas is basically where I am. It's 30 miles south of Oklahoma, so it really kind of is the taint of Texas. Uh, sorry if I if I say something that's off color, but anyway, uh, it does give us other opportunities, and I'll go over those in future reports. There's a, there's some stuff coming for sure. Uh, I'm sorry it's taking so long to get to this. Port O'Connor, Texas, is really about middle Texas Gulf Coast. Um, went down there at the beginning of September. It looked good. It may not have been a month, but it seems like it's been a month already. Um, I'll put the dates in the description. There's going to be a lot more in the description. You guys got to start reading descriptions because they'll have uh, guide names like the guides I recommend. Woo! Down there. And I don't recommend guides that don't return calls or don't return emails and there's a bunch of them so if their name's there it's because they I talk to them and they talk to me it's just the rules of the road just common courtesy so the people's names that you find as guides down there are vetted so to speak by me I may have fished with them at one time or another and I may not have but they have been willing to communicate with me and give me information and that's what the Port O'Connor area is 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 prone to know before you go. I've preached that in writing for years, preach it on videos. At the very end of my writing, usually on a place like this, it'll say know before you go. And so there are things you want to know before you go, but there are things you cannot know before you go. Tides may look right. The moon may be in the right phase for you if you're a new moon guy or whatever. And you know, there's full moon and new moon people. Um, tides you know, are more important than the moon, I think. But anyway, that's my opinion. Um, so you need to find someone on the coast that you can call in Port O'Connor, literally in Port O'Connor, and, and ask them certain things. When we got there, the water was extremely high. So when I say extremely high, imagine that bay system with an extra foot to foot and a half of water and the tides being neutralized, all because the wind was incoming into the system, the bay system, 
pushing water in. And part B, we don't know, I don't know for sure. This is my, you know, what people were rambling and rumbling on about. Part B of that is we had another hurricane that was passing by at that time. And it, of course, the pressure and the force of the wind on the water pushes, pushes not a wall of water, but it definitely raises water along its outer edges. You know, they call it the storm surge. Well, even if you're hundreds of miles away, it doesn't become a storm surge. It becomes a, a maybe you'd call it a tidal surge or something. It's just, it stays up. If the wind is coming from a weird direction, which it was like the northeast because of that circulation of the hurricane, totally unexpected wind, um, what will happen is that'll blow water into the system. Well, if the tide's coming in, it's blowing water in, extra water comes in. When the tide goes out and the wind's still blowing in, not as much water goes out on the outgoing. So then the tide comes in, more blows in. So what it does, it just edges its way up. And that was what we, what we learned from Scott Summerlot. So Summerlot, I didn't learn directly. Somebody, a guy I was with, CK, told me this. That, that that was the, what, what was going on and it made sense because as you'll see hopefully in the photos that uh, uh, that are interlaced the just a little ramp that leads out to uh, on the boat launch kept getting closer and closer to going underwater and finally it was totally underwater so it made very little sense that on ingoing incoming or outgoing that it would change uh, one changing so that's the reason Thank you, Scott Summerlot. He returns calls, and his information is down in the description. Captain Scott Summerlot. So what I did is a couple different things. Ride along with CK, and we went went shallow, and uh, caught some some. Uh, redfish and maybe a couple of trout, unconventional. But I was pretty much strictly limiting myself to the fly. And so um, one day, and these days are not in any particular order, I did go out and maintain myself as a fly guy, didn't go to the dark side. And I'm gonna do another video. All my videos are starting to weave, like a, weave in and out like a, a woven piece of fabric now. So there's going to be another video about how you translate your Texas Gulf Coast mirror lures into Texas Gulf Coast flies. Pretty cool. Worked great. The fly that I used was actually not a little bitty shrimp pattern, but it was a larger bait pattern and it just slaughtered. So that was really great. Uh, methodology. When your tide is up into the grass, right, the water's in the grass, it's a foot, foot and a half higher. What you've got is a situation where the fish are up in there too. I mean, they'll, they'll weave their way through the grasses and you'll hear them way back in the back and you can't get in there. So the way to do that is you pound the grass. So you pound the edges of that grass, blind casting because there's so much water. You won't, probably won't see a tail. You may see a push. And the push is when they're pushing a wake, you know, or pushing some water. And you got to be sure that you're not chasing after giant mullet creating pushes, okay? Because mullet can push too, but it's, it won't look the same once you get used to it. It'll look totally different on the push. And maybe you'll get a tail, maybe you won't. But in all likelihood, when you got one, one to one and a half feet more water, you won't. So what I did, and it worked out pretty good for me, was I just started pounding. One morning, I started pounding this area that was out of the wind. You got to find places that are out of the wind because the wind was really a, a, a factor in it from a weird direction. So that meant that I had to actually um, find a cove. It wasn't too dramatic and it wasn't in two inches of water, but um, it was far enough away from the crowds on a weekday. Weekdays, remember? Weekdays. Weekends are stupid at Port O'Connor, Texas. I mean, it is just stupid. Don't do it. If you can avoid it at all, never go to Port O'Connor for a weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. You can arrive on Sunday and then you got, you got the cream of the deal, Monday, Tuesday, whatever. Okay, so there's the grass line, probably 40, 50 feet. 
you're fanning it. So you fan cast it. You're stripping fast, okay? Because these bait coming out of the out of the out of the grass like that will be on the move trying to escape what it knows is a gauntlet of fish waiting there, right? And that's what I did with the big bait pattern and it worked really well. So that that was really cool. Enjoyed that. Um, saw some huge drum while we were there, black drum. Saw some actual like bull reds. Uh, but they were kind of lackadaisical. It was a kind of a time where uh, time of the year in September where they're just kind of getting their bearings and they seem to be like trying to you know figuring out it's time to go. It's time to move. It's time to do something. So that's what what we were exposed to. And it, we as far as big lunkers that just didn't happen. Um, trout are so plentiful now there. It's just it's just crazy. Speckled trout are just all over. They're usually, I mean, I caught a bunch in the like eight to 14 inch range. I mean, just dozens and dozens. So that's fun. Um, and that is what I primarily caught with that bait pattern that I'm gonna show you in that future video. Okay, so you have to, have, number one, you have to know somebody down there that has eyes on eyes on information about what the water is actually like at that point in time when you want to come down. Um, unfortunate in that, you know, problem is, you know, you book a place a month in advance, it's booked, right? Or two months or three or six months. So that's problematic. The only way you can really do this on a spontaneous thing is to not rent a, and rent a place to stay and just rough it which is doable. I mean, you know, you can figure something out. Port O'Connor is not the best for that, for sure. But Port Aransas, Aransas Pass really is good because you can sleep on the beach. Heck of a deal. If you're a DIY guy and you want to go to the coast, Port Aransas. It's a 110 miles from Port O'Connor, but it's got a lot more diversity of opportunities with kayaks and things like that. Um, so that's that. Now, that one of the other days that we were there, um, we did go out on the jetties in a bigger boat. That one that cut my leg, actually. Um, we kind of kissed the mate up. But went out on a bigger boat and pounded the jetties pretty hard, and the wind was okay. Everything seemed fine. Clarity was good. But, and we're looking for tarpon, you know, because we heard tarpon were, were uh, what they do is that they'll take the currents around the jetties and just do this on the jetties, um, eating hopefully, but gathering mostly. Never saw one. And there's another boat, friend of mine, Danny Scarborough, he was out there, nothing for Danny either. So that's two boats out there on the jetties on that particular day, and uh, that was a no-go. So um, there were some rude people out there that came, we were, we were set up with a spot lock, and. <laughs> A local Yahoo, I guess, and he came, or maybe not, probably wasn't local, came out and anchored right next to us. I mean, right next to us. I mean, I could throw a fly line past his boat uh, and just set up right there in our way. It was, it was really a touch and go situation. I don't, I don't have any uh, anger management going on, but I was angry. <laughs> So that other people on the boat were a little, little bit worked up about that. So we just left. We just left that. Left that to them. But your, your big holes on the jetties at Port O'Connor are out there on, on, on the, I don't know, north, south, east, west. The, the, top, the upper jetty, on the, right around the corner on both of these sides of the jetties, there's, there's big drop-in holes where you can drop in. If, you, if you're a bait chunker, chunk that bait down there, you got you a redfish. A big one, usually. I mean, we're talking big. Maybe even, probably even over slot. So that's how that goes. But anyway, um, I don't know what I'm leaving out. There'll be some video. I might do some voiceover on this. This is about Port O'Connor, Texas. You can text me anytime and I'll pass along any more information. You need to go to www.texasflycaster.com because there is where you can see stories from 2010, 2008 from Port O'Connor. And 
they're pretty hokey. <laughs> the video, the stories are okay. I'm, the videos as well. Video on YouTube also, the stories are okay. The videos are pretty hokey. So anyway, that was just when videos were coming around and it was just becoming a, uh, a style of doing reporting and stuff like that. So you have to forgive me for those long, long, long videos. But anyway, check them out. Long videos. But anyway, check those out. I'll, I might... Uh, I don't know, I might gather those up in a new list or something if I can, so that all Port O'Connor's together. There seems to be, just as an add-on, there seems to be pretty much a consensus that full moon is not the time to go. Now, I used to enjoy full moon as a kid because we were fishing under the lights. And looking back on it, it kind of makes sense because we we're fishing at night so the fish are nocturnal when the moon's out and so we caught more fish on a full moon because we we're fishing by the moon with lights but when you fish by the new moon the fish switch to daytime for better sight eating so I'm convinced that new moon is a winner and I may, it took me a while to switch my thinking on that. And it didn't happen now, it's been happening for a while. But, um, so when you do make reservations, make them for a new moon if you're fishing in the daytime. Uh, there's, no, there's no hard and set rules to this, but that's just one thing that I believe is true. On the extremes of new and full moon are the as I recall, that's the biggest movement of the tides, and you certainly want tide movement. And that's one thing we had very little of. So as that wind was pressuring water in and the hurricane was pressure, oh, mosquitoes, man. There's another thing you need besides spot and beer in October, and that's mosquito spray. Oof. And so um, while we were, um, uh, while we were there, because the tide and the winds was, wind was forcing against the tide and, and the, the push of the hurricane, the tides were almost slack the whole time. It just was not letting water out and push more water in, but it wasn't pushing it in by tidal movement, it was pushing it in by wind. So that's not as big as you think, um, actually. One more thing. So I don't have scripts. In case you guys haven't noticed, there's no script here. I just roll this off my head as it comes out, and sometimes it comes out, and sometimes it doesn't. There were jacks in the bay. So if you look for birds, like major birds, major action in the air, I came upon some jacks, and I got there a little bit late, and it was a nice size school of jacks, and they were slaughtering, slaughtering bait. They had it surrounded, and they were just cutting through it like knives, like mercenaries from the Middle Ages and uh, that was pretty spectacular unfortunately I was just befuddled because I was by myself if I had someone with me and we'd thrown out some some uh, conventional real quick it would have been on because it was just it was murder incorporated it was crazy so don't forget that you can find jacks under birds in the bay and we're talking a bay that's pretty shallow like that was six feet of water.